Hi everyone, uh, Brent here again. Uh, so we're continuing module two and this uh, set of mini lectures is going to be an introduction for you to the ethics of food and agriculture. This is part of the series from this week of September 7th to 11th. I'm going to share my screen with you <coughs> and start going through the PowerPoint. Okay, so there's going to be a few chunks to this. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about the utilitarian approach to food ethics, kind of building upon the utilitarian analysis we have of consumption from the previous set of lectures. So building from that, what are, what are the kind of ethical underpinnings of that? And what is an extension with the Rawls um, notion of fairness? Um, and then I'm going to go beyond those uh, utilitarian notions to other ethical principles, which you find more outside of economics that are also bear a lot heavily on issues in food and agriculture. So what is ethics? Uh, sort of a, dec a, the, a dif dictionary definition is uh, that there are rules of behavior. So how do we behave? What are the rules that define our behavior based on ideas about what is morally good and morally bad? So what are morals? Uh, a moral is something that we consider to be decent or good, honest, honorable, just, right, righteous, virtuous. Uh, so how do we define what is honorable, virtuous, and right in society? So if we go look back to this utilitarian notion of ethics, what, do, what is considered to be good or honorable or righteous in that, kind of underlying that model? Um, and what we see here is that it, it implicitly implies that a society that maximizes total utility, so utility is enjoyment or happiness we get from consuming goods and services, any society that maximizes total utility um, is moral or ethical. Um, so we would test that uh, we are at an ethical, say, distribution of resources when we can't increase, increase one person's utility without reducing another person's utility. Um, in benefit-cost analysis, we call that Calder-Hicks optimal. So in that utilitarian world, is, as we sort of reached at the end of the last set of lectures, when supply equals demand and we have a market equilibrium, if work markets work perfectly, uh, then we have the maximum utility and we would call that ethical. And then in that case, if we follow that kind of logic as our goal, then the role of government would be to make sure markets work right. So, and there are things in which we say, oh, uh, markets aren't working right when we have one of these four things, any one of these four things. One is that we don't have perfect information, so we have a situation of imperfect information. That might be, for example, when a potential buyer lacks information that help them to, to decide how much they're willing to pay for a good. And we covered at the end, uh, in one of the modules last time, this idea of credus attributes. So if there are things that are, valu are valuable to people they can't see, um, the market may not work very well, the government may have a role to help uh, communicate better to that buyer uh, on behalf of the seller. That's where we have things like required standard nutrition labeling or ingredient labeling on food packaging. So requiring that and allowing, so saying what needs to be included or, or what, what may be included is a role for government. Another possibility when we have market failure is because of externalities. Uh, when production or consumption by one agent has a negative effect on others. So it can be a production externality is when, say, production uh, uh, like burning of biomass or straw that produces smoke that has a negative effect on someone else's health. Uh, that would be considered a negative production externality. We could also have a, a negative consumption externality if uh, one person consuming something Effects has effect on others. So if I consume batteries and I put batteries into the water supply, 
and the gut causes heavy metal pollution for others, then that's a negative consumption externality. Externalities can be positive, uh, that is, the, the other person benefits from them, or negative, that is, the other person does not benefit from them. In which case, either of those cases uh, would justify government involvement. For example, in, that, in the straw burning case, uh, we might have a tax or a regulation on, the, on, say, the timing of straw burning. A third case of, uh, mark, of uh, market imperfection or market failure is public goods. These are goods that uh, we say they're goods that are non-rivalrous and non-excludable. So non-rivalrous means that one person can benefit without having any effect on the way that another person benefits. Uh, so we can think about a beautiful sunrise might be a non-rivalrous, non my enjoyment of it uh, shouldn't Im impede on your enjoyment of that sunrise. Um, also non-excludable, there's just difficult to exclude others. So that uh, a person um, who, who would like to uh, exclude others for some reason so they could say sell it, uh, it, it finds it very, very difficult to do so. Uh, an example of a public good, something that's close to meeting these, um, these um, criteria is food inspection, especially food inspection at ports, at, uh, of imported food at ports. So that's something that is a public good that we would expect, uh, in that case, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to do for us. Um, another case of uh, market failure is unregulated monopolies. So these are businesses that for some reason are able to exert large influence over the price at which they sell goods uh, and able to extract extra profits from consumers as a result of it. So uh, an example was of a, of a monopoly was when Sobeys bought all the Safeway stores in Canada about two years ago or so, uh, it gave them large numbers of neighborhoods where Sobeys or Safeways, which were now the same company, were really the main options that the most consumers had available to them. And the Canadian, anti, um, Canadian Antitrust Agency then uh, brought a, made a ruling that for that merger to happen, that the Sobeys would have to sell uh, out at least 29 of their stores across Af Canada uh, to reduce their monopoly power. Okay, so that's one idea of, um, of util this utilitarian ethics. Uh, the ethics of utilitarian model is that uh, if maximizing the sum of, of happiness of people. Um, the another possibility, but that actually doesn't say anything about, about how much different people have. So to say that one person can't benefit without another person losing doesn't tell us anything about how much happiness one person gets or how much happiness another person gets. John Rawls added a, a different notion of ethics about fairness uh, to say, uh, if even in a world where we only think about uh, the happiness people get from consuming stuff, we should also need to think about not just the totality of happiness people get, but the allocation of that happiness. He, uh, in his theory of justice, which is really focused on this idea of fairness in a utilitarian concept. Um, he came up with this idea of the veil of ignorance as a thought experiment to think about what might be fair, what might be considered to be fair if we had this case. So imagine the case of planners of a society. These are the three, uh, these probably are men, three wise men who are sitting there, who are standing there blindfolded, who are making choices about uh, the rules of fairness for a society. What kind of society would they design, right? Uh, given that um, they don't know whether uh, who, who's who in a society, right? So uh, if they didn't know, if they were designing, if these three people were designing the society, then they had to become a member of the society and they be, could, could become any person in that society. Um, they don't know where they are. They don't know how many goods they would get. They don't know as, as a sort of base allocation. They don't know how smart they would be. They don't know their strength. What kind of society would they design? And he came up with this, uh, a, a, um, the veil of ignorance test 
to think that you would want to design a, a society like this, a society that has these two um, principles. The first principle of Rawls' principle of fairness is equal liberty. That is that everyone should be entitled to basic freedoms, freedoms of speech, liberty, pursuit of happiness, fair value of, politi of um, political liberties uh, that are consistent with the liberties of others. So there should be a set of, of capacities or, or freedoms you have to do things in society that you can do uh, as long as they're consistent with others. The difference principle uh, is that there, sh there can be differences between people as long as differences improve the situation of the worst off. So that uh, the worst off are the most vulnerable in society. In a sense, they should have kind of first priority. If we do things that improve the, better, the well-being of the first off, the, the worst off, right? Worst off improve, it's okay for others to improve even more than the worst off, right? As long as the worst off improve. So this is the possibility of differences, uh, that there may be these differences in society. And that's, but these two principles uh, are pretty similar to what I'm gonna talk about in a couple of minutes about what's procedural justice is pretty similar to the idea of equal liberty. That is that uh, the, there should be kind of freedoms uh, the procedures should allow certain um, freedoms to, um, to be in place. Um, and the idea of, the, of distributive justice is that uh, pretty similar to the Rawls notion of the difference principle. Okay, I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to stop um, here uh, before I move into the critique of Rawls, the utilitarian Rawls notion, um, just, to, just to take a break. So. We'll stop here.